Hello, everybody. Hey, that was great. The clapping room. Get out of the way ahead of time, because you might not need it. You might not need it afterwards. <laughs> so we're going to talk about security, obscurity, and secrets. Oh, bye. So uh, at any point, feel free to like shout out. You're wrong because I probably am. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, I've developed an interest in security lately because I'm working on a home cloud system and some other things where they just need to be as secure as possible. Um, so first off, let's talk about what these words mean so that there's not ambiguity. Um, security is, I think, best associated with terms like privacy or safety. And so the, the metaphor that we're pulling from would be something like, a lock or a three foot thick safe. Um, yeah, it's it's your security is you are guarding something to keep it private from uh, others that don't have access to it that you authorize and uh, that keep it safe from damage or corruption. Obscurity is more like things that are anonymous or that are simply not intuitive. So examples would be, um, my car is in the parking lot and my laptop's in the back seat, so I throw a jacket over top of it. Um, it doesn't make my laptop any more secure, it just makes it in an unintuitive way. Uh, it's unintuitive that my laptop's in my car, right? Or if I have some code that I'm shipping to a browser or that I'm putting on an iOS device or an Android device, um, I might minify it or I might have some sort of credential in the code that I want to fool myself into thinking that someone's not going to get access to in 30 seconds after they install it. So I might, I might do something like minify my code or I take that key and I like reverse it and then like multiply every bit by seven and then like subtract and then you know do something weird that's not actually secure at all but just makes it more confusing so I have to read a couple lines of code to figure out what's going on. Um, or if you use like a pseudonym and then somebody might punch me in the face for saying this but I would argue that Tor is obscure not secure because uh, Tor is all about routing things in a different way to like hide your identity from the person that you're communicating with, which is just really strange to me why you'd want to hide your identity from someone that you're communicating with. Um, and it doesn't really offer any, like, any more privacy than HTTPS does as far as I'm aware and what I've read. It just puts a couple different layers of HTTPS on or like similar that wrap and then unwrap as packets go back and forth, but then the NSA runs like half the Tor network. It was started by the military. So they wanted the public to use it because they were afraid that if only the military used it, well then there'd be absolutely no obscurity because you know that every computer on the network was a military computer. Um, tangent. Anyway, so uh, obscurity is like something that's like either guessable or discoverable. Um, so there's, there's no security in obscurity. And then there's secrets. And the difference between like secrets and something that's obscure is that a secret is something you generally keep physically secure. Like my car key is a secret. And my passphrase is in my mind, it's a secret. So these are things that there's not technical barriers around them per se, but there are physical barriers in the real world. Um, and we are in charge of keeping them safe. Uh, and secrets are what help us to authorize and authenticate, which are slightly different. <coughs> Any questions up to this point? Can you just turn the mic forward just a bit? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I thought it sounded too loud. My voice carries really well, so I just pushed it away because I don't like the sound of my voice. It's just recording. Oh, it's recording it. Okay. That makes sense now. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here's another thought when you're considering security. Trust 
can only be granted. Like, if you think of a situation where you've trusted someone, you can never take that trust away. Because trust can time travel, and you cannot. So if I trust John, and then at some point I stop trusting John, so like John has my car keys, and then all of a sudden I discover, you know, after John has had my car keys for six months, I discover that my mileage is like way, way high, and John was supposed to just use my car occasionally for this or that, but it turns out he must have made a trip to California while I was sleeping because like the miles are way, way high, right? Well, now, not only can I not trust John, but even if I take my key away from him, I can't trust that he didn't make a copy of my key. I can't trust that maybe something's not wrong with my car that wasn't wrong before. Um, I can't trust where my car has been. Like, so once you've granted trust, it's kind of like that idea of once you put something on the internet, it never goes away. Um, unless you wanted it, like your MySpace, MySpace profile, in which case it's just gone. Um, but <laughs> trust is the same way. Like once you give trust, you can never truly revoke it because you don't know what actions might have happened in the past that you didn't know that you didn't trust at the time. And security is not binary. So it is a qualitative measure. So I can't say like, is my car secure right now? And say, yes, it's secure. I'd have to say like, well, it's reasonably secure. Like there's nothing in my car right now that anyone would want to steal, I don't think. And it's locked and the alarm will go off if somebody tries to break into it. They're probably not gonna have very good luck in like taking the car itself so I say, you know, relatively speaking, for what I'm concerned about, my car is secure. Um, so the question, and any time you're, you're talking about security, is really just how secure it is. Because there's a safe that you get at the dollar store that you can just stick a pocket knife into and jiggle and make the, you know, handle come open. Um, and then there's that three foot thick safe that's fireproof and all that other stuff. And when we're talking about security in the software world, I am of the opinion that the important bit is that we want to make humans the attractive vector of attack. Like the purpose of encrypting things and, uh, and, and keeping them private online like my bank account is really just to make it so that it's easier to come up and put a gun to my head and say, give me all your money than it is to sit outside my house in your car, open up your laptop, and sit there for 3,000 years while um, it tries to decode the decryption keys that I'm using with my bank that are changing every time I sign in. Does that make sense? An important corollary to that, though, is that whatever security you're employing shouldn't make the human attack vector weaker. So, like, the best example of this that I can think of is a mandatory uh, password rotation policy. Uh, this is going to make the human attack vector much, much weaker because the IT support guy is going to be used to, at the first Monday of every month, when, you know, the passwords were reset on that Friday and it's been a long weekend and they don't remember what they reset their password to, then the IT guy is going to get all these calls and he knows that they're coming the first Monday of every month. It's a guarantee. Everybody in the company is going to call and be like, I don't remember what I set my password to on Friday, right? So mathematically, you're technically more secure because you're increasing the entropy by rotating a password. But in practice, you're actually less secure because you've made it more of a burden on people and people are weak and malleable and... Uh, their pay grade relative to how secure you want something, uh, a person that's getting paid 15 bucks an hour probably doesn't care to validate everybody's driver's license before he resets their, their password on the company computer, right? Uh, oh, another thing about obscurity. So, 
if you could document some process that you're doing, is anybody doing something that you suspect might be obscure rather than secure in any of your web stuff right now? Yeah, we got one hand. You, you can go ahead. I, I know some of you other people, we got stuff too. So if this is the, the litmus test. If you documented what you were doing and made it public to everyone, would they be able to get into the system or the thing that you are trying to prevent access to? If the answer is that documenting your procedure would make it so that somebody could get in, then it is definitely not secure, it is obscure. Unless that, of course, is a secret because I don't document my passphrase. Um, and, you know, that's that, that line. Yeah, so I said that. So credit cards, entropy bits, keys, things, those are secret. All right, so let's talk about types of privacy real quick. So there's public and private keys. And this is, HTTPS uses a combination of both public-private, public-private, which are known as asymmetric, and then uh, shared secrets, which are known as symmetric. So public-private key is I don't really understand how it works, but it's basically like, the, like this. If you can imagine a machine where you stick one key in the machine and you turn it, and that locks the machine, but now the mechanism in the machine somehow, like you can't turn it again. Uh, there, like once you've turned it once with this key, you can't turn it again. So if I turn it with this key and I lock it, then I am done. That's all I can do. But I have another key and if I stick that in there and I turn it, then I can unlock it with that key. So you can probably imagine like some, some mechanism probably exists like this. Like before we had encryption, I bet there was some sort of bank vault that required this kind of awkward key system. And then the, it would also be true that if I take this key that I just unlocked it with, now that it's in the unlocked state, I can turn it and lock it with this key and then I wouldn't be able to unlock it unless I put in this key and turn it. So that's kind of how uh, public-private keys work, is it's a set of numbers that are somehow related, and there's some sort of mechanism between them that I don't really understand entirely, but suffice it to say it's like that. Um, so there's a bunch of tables of bits, and you put the one key in, it tells the tables to turn this way, and and that, and or that, and zor this, and zam that, and then when it's done, it puts data through those tables, and then the data comes out on the other side in this really weird, wonky way, and the only way to get the data to reverse is if you then take your, you know, your public key, or I mean your private key, and then turn it, and then that would somehow make the tables turn back the other way, and then all the data goes back through, and then, and then it's, uh, it's visible again. Uh, so this is what HTTPS does when you connect to your bank website. So you have, like right now, you're not connected to your bank website. You go to mybank.com, and what happens is that you receive the bank's public key. It just gives it to you. It's like, hey, here's my public key. And then you take that public key, and you're like, I'm gonna think a number of a number between 40 quadrillion and 41 quadrillion. And then you think of a number, and then you encrypt that number with this public key, you send it back to the bank, and then the bank unlocks that number with its private key, it pulls out that number, and it's like, ah, 40 quadrillion, septillion, 65 quadrillion, 95 and six. And then it's like, cool, that's the number that we're gonna agree on. And then it uses that number like a Caesar cipher. Does anybody know what a Caesar cipher is? Uh, um, my Little Annie uh, secret decoder ring. And you spin it around, like you pick, you know, today's numbers are B and two, and so you line up B and two, and then you spin the ring around, and then you can see like how it lines up. That's kind of how this asymmetric cipher works, except that it's, um, it's a lot more complicated. It has like those rotating tables of, of anding and zoring and oring, so that even if you know the message and you know uh, the encrypted message, that doesn't actually help you at all to decrypt it. Um, but it's a similar kind of concept, and that's, that's a, a shared secret. And so that's what AES is. So when you connect to your bank, you guys agree on this number, and then you use that number as your, your shared secret. And the reason that you do this instead of just like, I'm gonna give you my public key, and I'm gonna take your public key, and we're gonna like give each other these messages that are signed this way over and over and over again, 
is because RSA encryption, which is like a popular method for HTTPS for that public-private handshake, it's really, really slow. In fact, pretty much every type of public-private encryption is ridiculously slow. It's not so slow to do like just a little tiny bit because it's only a little tiny bit, but it's really slow to like you don't want to transfer a gigabyte of data with with public private encrypted key stuff because it, it just CPU and all your cores explode. Bad news, right? Symmetric encryption is like super fast. It's just like wicked fast. Um, and so that's why you HTTPS first exchanges those public private keys so they can exchange the asymmetric or I mean the symmetric key, the shared secret, and then the data comes through really fast and then we're happy because HTTPS isn't slow, which means that we're not afraid to use HTTPS because we're not going to be like, oh, I have to buy a more powerful server to serve my users, because that's not really true. Like, your server is good enough. But if we were using only RSA, then that might not be true. That'd be sad. The other thing is that um, public private keys allow you to sign and to verify something. So I take some data, and I basically, what I do is I, I, I take like the SHA-256 stuff. Like, you guys know MD5 SHA? You know, so it's this, uh, you take a bit of data in and you run some math on it and it gives you like this one small little number that's, you know, only a couple billion digits long or something, you know. <laughs> what is it, like 250, I don't know. 256 bits of entropy, I think, is what a SHA-256 sum is, right? So anyway, um, the point is you, you take some data and then you SHA sum it and then you add to that plus the SHA sum before and you SHA sum it. And you do this thing, and you take this gigabyte file, and you reduce it down to like basically a word. Um, so the way that the signature stuff works is basically you take your data, you do that SHA sum on it, and then when you're done with the SHA sum, you um, you uh, like in, encrypt it or something, and then SHA sum it again, because you end up with like this pretty small text, um, but it can represent you know this big huge thing. Um, and uh, that's about as far as I can go into that because I only understand it about about this much. But that's kind of how it works. And the verify process is just reverse, like we've been talking about. And the thing here, the exchange at the bottom is like uh, what I was saying with HTTPS. It's really common to use RSA to exchange a shared secret um, so that you have something public you can start with that it doesn't matter if an attacker interprets. Uh, so you, you can use these public-private keys to do that exchange. And then shared secrets. Uh, have you heard of HMAC before? Have you done OAuth before? <clears throat> OAuth 1. Okay, so OAuth 1, the thing that scared everybody was HMAC, because they see the word HMAC in cryptographically secure, their brain explodes, and they're like, I don't know how it's done. Um, HMAC is actually really uh, simple. Uh, like I've got down here, it's basically you take a SHA sum of the content of your message plus whatever the shared secret is, and you have to distribute that shared secret somehow beforehand. Normally with OAuth, you go onto Twitter's webpage and you say create app, and it's like, here, copy this secret thing. And then you copy that secret thing, and then every time you send a message, it's not super complicated. All it's doing is just taking a shot sum of the data and then adding your secret to it as kind of like a salt, more or less. That's the, the dummy version of it. Um, and then, Symmetric keys, AES is really common for symmetric encryption. It's really fast, and uh, the encrypting and decrypting happen at the same speed, so it's just it's an ideal algorithm. And there's no known method of, um, of like exploiting it or attacking it that can bring it down to you know, within several hundred thousand lifetimes of a human being, assuming that every computer on the planet was concentrated on trying to break that key. Um, like, it's, it's mathematically impossible to, to break it. So those are some cool things. Um, so why do you guys use HTTPS, or do you not currently? Who's using HTTPS? That's good. That makes me happy. All right, why are you guys using it? What, is, what benefits does it give you? Privacy. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like, for reals. Like, what, why was it important to you make that decision? Was it because my boss told me to? Was it because I care about my users? Was it because 
I think it's cool and I want to learn something new. Like, why do you guys do it? I'm just going to stay in here. Well, exactly what you had. Somebody, a third party can't listen in on you to your communication. It's private. Okay. So the reason HTTPS is good, it's good for, I mean, there's like, I could add 100,000 things to this list probably, or at least three. Um, I didn't because I was lazy. Well, there are three, but I could add at least three more. Um, so when you're looking at users from the user perspective of like, I'm using mybank.com or I'm using awesomeapp.com, there's two things that suck for users. One is ad insertion. Have you ever been to a public Wi-Fi hotspot and then like, before it, it, like, when it when you go on it, it starts inserting ads at the top of every page. Like, the 90s, this was really popular. Like, you remember Net Zero? And uh, there's, I, I, I don't know, probably GoGo Inflighted, probably, I, I don't want to get sued by them or anything, but I'm sure that they've done something like that. They seem like one of those companies that does really annoying things. Um, you know, but you remember this happening. Um, and then there's snooping. And not even, like, malicious snooping, just, like, you're at BYU in the Richards building, and you're sitting down there with your laptop open and Wireshark going, Wireshark going, and you're just reading people's Facebook conversations for kicks and giggles. Who did that? Okay, I'm not the only one. That's good. That's good. And nothing malicious about it. It's just, you know, fun. But I don't know that I really want someone else doing that to me. <laughs> um, and then if you're a provider, if you're providing something to your users, uh, a lot of times, in exchange for what you're giving them, you are taking from them some of their attention towards an ad. And if you're not using HTTPS, um, so one DBAG actually had his router thing set up so that it would look for Google Analytics, like the UA underscore, you know, XXXXX, and it would swap it out with his. So anytime you joined his network, like, it would still serve you all the ads, but he'd get all the money for it. Um, which is kind of ingenious. I, you got to give him credit for that. I, I don't know that I wouldn't do it myself, honestly. <laughs> but, um, so, both for your users and for you, there are really practical benefits, and these are just a couple of them. Um, so, I, I will show you how to do HTTPS in Node uh, once we're done chatting. I'm sorry, this isn't a lot of code, but it's a lot of high-level stuff. Hopefully this is uh, good for you. Um, okay, so HTTPS, it offers privacy, but it doesn't really give you, um, oh, that's what I want to do, this one. Uh, authentication or authorization, I mean, it kind of does, but not really, because if you think about the applications in which you use it, and, and I mean, it, it gives you that privacy from point to point, from me to mybank.com. But um, when you think of, it, it doesn't solve these problems, like, if, where did the code in my application come from? Like, I want the code in my application to come from mybank.com, right? But there might be some other code. There might be some, like, um, I don't think there's any way to get around plugins right now in Chrome. It's just if a user wants a plugin, then they get a plugin. And I think that's all right, as long as they're aware of what the risks are. Um, but you want to you wanna say, you know, where did this script come from? Did it come from a CDN? Did it come from the console? Did it come from a bookmarklet? Did it come from... Uh, rogue injection, uh, because some of these things we want, you know, maybe we want users to be able to type in the console and, uh, well, I think in all sites you can still type in the console even if they have the CSP stuff turned on. Um, but you want them maybe to be able to use a bookmarklet, uh, maybe, or maybe you don't. Um, and HTTPS doesn't solve this problem. It doesn't solve this application problem. It also doesn't solve, like, the social media problem of, I mean, how many times has somebody told you about a post you made on Facebook that you authorized to make, but you weren't really aware of it? We don't, we don't use Facebook, then. I know, I'm the only person who uses Facebook in the room, what it's like. Okay, because I've had that happen where somebody's like, oh yeah, I saw that thing you posted on Facebook about this band. I'm like, I didn't post that about that band. Um, so like, I didn't do it. I personally did not perform that particular action. And sometimes it's useful to know, like, if it was me that did it, or if it was, like, somebody doing it on my behalf, or it was somebody that did it not on my behalf. Um, and these are things that aren't really well solved yet. Like, we have some solutions for these questions that are emerging, but these are just things that, like, they're just not solved. But I wanted to bring it up as, 
you know, like HTTPS isn't the answer to everything. Um, so two more slides before we look at code. I think that's all it is. Have you guys heard of any of this stuff? Oh, sadness. So Let's Encrypt is really cool. If you're not using HTTPS, come September, you have absolutely no excuse whatsoever. Because Mozilla has joined up with some others in this project called Let's Encrypt. It's letsencrypt.org. And uh, you can go to their GitHub page. You can clone this repository. And I'm sure that eventually it'll make it into like Brew and AppKit and all that. Um, but basically, all you got to do is install this tool on a server that you own, give it some really basic information. I think the only thing it requires is your email address and the, do the domain that you're trying to validate. And then it'll just establish this loopback procedure and go out and grab an HTTPS certificate and put it in a folder that's a predictable location that like everybody that installs the tool, it's all going to go into the same. It's slash Etsy, slash Let's Encrypt, slash Live, slash whatever.com slash uh, key.pem or privkey.pem and chain.pem and fullchain.pem and something else. But anyway, um, so like all the hard work of like, oh, I have to click a button in my email and I got to pay $10 and life is hard. Like you won't have that excuse either. So I'm really excited about that. Um, CSP kind of solves these problems here on the left. It's content security privacy. Every browser supports this now, even Microsoft Edge, which, in case you didn't know, Internet Explorer is officially dead. And Microsoft Edge is replacing it, and it is not compatible with Internet Explorer. You can ask a lot of corporate sites how happy they are about it because it has no ActiveX controls. It has no extended features that don't exist in standard browsers. So all of those corporate applications that, it, that exist in... Uh, like, there's no compatibility mode. It's like, when people upgrade to Microsoft Edge, everything that was Internet Explorer only is broken. And there's no way to de detect programmatically that it's Microsoft Edge. Like, there's no, it doesn't have any funky features. There's no Microsoft object or anything. Um, so that's really cool. Microsoft has uh, implemented CSP and Web Crypto. I think their CSP implementation is still a little bit behind, but the point is, it's there. Like you can rely on this in every browser now, um, at least to some extent. JWT is a JavaScript web token. It's basically the antithesis of a cookie, and I might have time to show you a little bit about that. Um, Ursa is a library in Node for doing RSA, so you can you can sign some piece of information and verify some piece of information. And then SRP is this new term. I don't know if it's really going to catch on as a buzzword or not. In the olden days, I think we called it proof of secret. Um, but this is a really good idea. Uh, this is not a specific technology, but a concept, which is that instead of, like normally, you like who's got users log in somewhere? OK, so you've got some form, and they type in Bob, and then they type in some password, like password. 37 because you've been rotating me on my freaking passwords and I'm up to 37 now and I got to put in my password like five times because I can't remember whether it's password 36 or password 38. Anyway, well, so there's 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 one simple thing that we could have been doing for a very 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 long time um, that greatly increases the user's privacy, which is that instead of sending the secret because you know that they're going to take the same secret on every single site, like don't even try to tell your users like. Oh, it's more secure to use lots of different passwords. It's more secure to have something in my backpack that has 60,000 passwords in it than it is to just have like two or three that are kept up here. No, it's more secure to have two or three that are kept up here. But what you can do is you can, you can create a proof of secret. So basically, in the simplest form of this would be uh, you take some salt that's application specific, that's delivered with your web app and your iOS app and your Android app. It's the same salt, some random bits of entropy. And you just shot some that with the password on the client so that when they send it from the client, they're sending something that's unique to your website and you never know what their password is. So when Heartbleed 2 happens, are you guys familiar with Heartbleed? Yeah, so Heartbleed was a vulnerability and uh, it didn't really affect that many servers. I mean, it, like the, the articles came out and said, oh, it affects 90% of the servers on the internet. That's like assuming that 90% of the servers on the internet were running 
like Ubuntu 14.04, and within the last six weeks, they had upgraded OpenSSL and then hadn't upgraded it in three weeks since, kind of thing. So it wasn't a bit, but it was a big deal for anybody that was affected by it because it meant that all of the server's memory was available in 64 kilobyte chunks. So you just basically ping the server and do like a, it's like a, an SSL hello or something, and then like the server responds back, and it was supposed to respond back with something else, but instead what it responded back with was like 64K of memory um, just from the server, and so that, that was bad. But if that were to happen again, which if something's happened once, it's infinitely more likely to happen again, so we will have a heart bleed too at some point, um, you would never have the, ser the, the user's credentials even in your server's memory, so if your server was completely compromised, there's no way that somebody, you know, even if they were able to read out of the RAM, there's no way that somebody would ever uh, be able to get that user's password unless it was something like so super simple that they brute forced it within the first, you know, like 100,000 attempts or whatever, which I guess is possible. But anyway, uh, point being, you don't have to send the user's password. You can send a proof of their password, and that's a good idea. Did that make sense? Any questions about that? Because I feel like I rambled a little bit. That's what I do sometimes. All right, and then web crypto. Web crypto is awesome. Um, so some quick tips of increasing security, just some random things I thought of. Don't ever render HTML. We know this is bad. Just don't do it. You're probably not smart enough. Your friend's probably not smart enough. You're probably going to screw it up. Just don't render HTML. Like, use an extremely well-tested library. Like, you know, Rails has got something that it uses. Just don't, don't ever render raw HTML. If, if there's some well-tested framework that, that can do it for you and, and you know it's good, then maybe use it, but just try not to render HTML because if you render HTML, eventually you're going to render user content and eventually you're going to forget to escape it or you're going to use some function in that library that is an unescaped function and then you've pwned your site. But there's hope. Don't use cookies. Because one of the problems with rendering HTML and like a dozen other things is that somebody can like post to your site and uh, from another site, like, you know, they've got one tab here and another tab here, and they can do a post, and then that post will carry with it cookies. And then those cookies will authenticate that user on behalf of the malicious site. So if you don't use cookies, then you don't have this problem, which now it's like, well, how do I authenticate if I'm not using cookies? And that's where JWT comes in. It's really simple. Um, but since I spent all my time blabbing, I might not get to show too many examples. Uh, don't send error messages to the user that you didn't personally qualify. So let's go back to, oh, back to this great technology I was touting. So I was talking about AES and how awesome it is and how there's like no known attack vectors that will bring it to its knees. Well, there is one, and it has to do with error messages. If you decrypt some data on behalf of the client, and that data sends back an error, there's a couple different types of errors that you could get from AES. And one of those errors is a padding error, and I don't exactly know what it means, but basically, it's like you send it bits until you get this type of error. And when you get that type of error, you put a little notch in your scorecard of like, I figured something out. And you do this like 100,000 times, which or maybe a million times, but when you think about it a hundred thousand times, a million times, that's nothing. Like you can do that in a day, right? Um, and if you have local access to some process that's not like time restricting you, then you could do it maybe a lot faster. But anyway, the point is you can take these padding errors and then you can determine not what the person's secret was, but basically the way the tables were turned. Because I was talking about this like metaphor of these tables that are turning as like you put secrets in and it churns them and they and, to and and zor and all that, you can basically figure out what process those tables are doing, what that function is, and be able to then decrypt any message. So, um, like error messages are sometimes dangerous. Um, and then another thought is don't redirect from HTTP to HTTPS in your API. You want to do this for like your index.html because you want your user to be able to get there. But what you don't want is like this person's like goofing around with curl and they, you know, they get your API thing working and then then it, it works. And so they, they copy and paste that just as it is and they put it in their, you know, their Ruby code or their node code. And then like it works. 
And so now they're building this app where like every single time they're making an API request, they're making the API, re API request, and then your server's saying, hey, no, 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 don't send that to me here. Send that to me over here. And so then you're sending it once unsecured, and then once secured, and then it works. So um, hopefully, I, I don't know. By default, maybe some things are better about this than others, but um, yeah, don't redirect your, your APIs. So now I want to show you some code. Now that you're thoroughly asleep, you can wake back up again, because we'll do code. Yay for code! <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm a little uh, goofy. All right, so what did I want to show? Let's get the my console up here. So first and foremost, um, I wanted to show you guys HTTPS in Node because that is just a really super easy thing to do. And um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to npm install global serve HTTPS. So this is this little module that I made. And it's like the bare minimum stuff that you need to do to serve HTTPS. And we'll take a look at it and see what it looks like. So I'm going to go to user, local, lib. In fact, maybe I should just go to GitHub. Let me go to GitHub. And this is what it is. All right. So the, the reason I created this is there's a lot of benefit to testing with HTTPS in your development environment. So even when you're on localhost, don't use localhost um, because the there's policies are different. Like the security policy is different. The cookies policy is a little bit different. Like some things are different about it. But if you use a real domain, so I have this, this domain, which is localhost.dapply.com, and that's, it's just the domain for development. And so I have this little server, and it'll serve things up to you, and it'll use actual valid certificates that are for localhost.dapply.com. Um, and so in Node, instead of requiring HTTP, you just require HTTPS. So a lot of people, I'm going to jump around a little bit, forgive me. If this doesn't make sense, just stop and ask a question. So a lot of people are used to seeing something like this, where it's var, express, equals, require, oops, um, express, and then you do you know, your var, oops, I forgot my, uh, I used straight up there. App express equals express, and you do like app.listen, and then it's got some number, some function. Anybody done this before? Okay, don't do this. Don't do this. I mean, do it if you want to, but it's not hard to do it the node way, and then it makes it more obvious like when you need to do things like WebSockets. Like, anybody try to attach a WebSocket after doing it this way? And then like figure out like I don't know how to attach a web socket to this thing. No. Okay. Well, e you can't. Um, you have to use Node's HTTP server or HTTPS server. So I'll show you the right way to do this, and that's the way that we're looking at. So HTTPS equals require HTTPS, and then instead of app dot listen, you create a server. And then there's going to be some options that we got to talk about real quick, but they're really simple. But I'm going to omit them for the moment. And then instead of app.listen, you do server.listen, and then you do server.onRequest, and then you pass it your Express app. So it's like two more lines of code, but then you can use HTTPS, you can uh, attach WebSocket handlers. Uh, you can have it be an asynchronous process in case like there's something in your app, your app is more than just a simple web server, and there's like some asynchronous process that needs to happen before your, your app is ready. You can start listening and have connections queuing up while the app is initializing, and then when it starts accepting connections, you can go. So um, this is, I, I consider, the, the right way to do it. It's the, the real node way. So anyway, we take HTTPS. And then for your pleasure and, and ease of use, I, I just bundled the certificate as an NPM module. So if you just want to have HTTPS, 
without doing anything, you can use it. And then pretty soon you'll be able to do pretty much the same thing with the Let's Encrypt module. Um, so let's look at what it is that goes into that, because I just did the little object for you. So I've got this other repository that is the certificates repository, and there's lib. And I go through the whole process here. I explain exactly, there's a little video showing how I registered my certificate. So if you can't wait till September, which I recommend you don't, and you want to get started using HTTPS on a domain, um, you can you can just follow through, and I, I tell you, you know, play by play what I did in order to get these, and there's even a screencast for it. But anyway, so I've got in here this index.js. This is what the object looks like that you pass to HTTPS. And you don't need to specify all of these things. I specified them all so that you can see what the options are, because it's always easier to go back and change an option if you know that it exists. The only thing that we really need to be concerned with is there's that private key which also, the private key file in RSA also contains the public key. It's actually a key pair, but it's considered the private key. So you, you give it a path to a private key that's in a text format. Then you give it, um, the certificate is basically, you create some text that describes what domain you have, what your email address is, where you live, that kind of thing. You send that off to the the signing authority, the certificate authority, and then they send you back that same information that you gave them, except they signed it with their key, and their public key is listed in the browser, and so that's how the browser knows, like, it's a green lock versus a red lock with an X, as if um, it's been signed off by a key that's already in the browser. So that's what the cert file is. And then um, the CA is the chain. Because when you pay $1,000 for an HTTPS certificate, what you get is like this, it's like higher up the chain and it's got some validation on it. It's like guaranteed to work in any browser since like 1996 because it's like the original certificate of authority or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's marginally better in, in some sense like that that's really esoteric. Um, but most of the time, you're going to buy a cheap certificate because you want to pay $10, not $1,000, or you want to use Let's Encrypt to get a free certificate. And so you're not going to get, your certificate isn't going to be signed directly by uh, the thought.com. It's going to be signed by like GeoTrust that had theirs signed by thought.com. Or it's going to be signed by like supercheapssl.com, which was signed by GeoTrust, which was signed by um, thought.com. And so these... Uh, CA files are just saying like, hey browser, if you don't recognize who signed me because I was like super cheap and found like the crappiest free type of certificate that isn't Let's Encrypt because Let's Encrypt is going to be awesome. Um, but like one of these like really shady SSL providers right now, um, it's like if you don't recognize the one that signed me, you'll recognize the one that signed them or the one that signed them. So you still get the green lock instead of the red lock. Any questions about that? All right. So I'm going to take like two more minutes and show you JWT and then be done. Um, but if you look on my blog, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, my blog is coolajw6.com. And not every article that I have on encryption stuff is complete because some of them like I got halfway and then I needed to go research something else and then like so it's not all complete but um, I think I have there's a number of different things if you just search some of these terms you can find and for a lot of them I have screencasts that show like how I set it up and explain a little bit about it um, but I was going to show you JWT. JWT is really simple it looks like this let me open up a gist here It looks like this. Blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 blah. And what this is, is it's a base 64 section on the left that has some metadata. It's going to say, like, what type of RSA signing was used, or was it HMAC signing, or, like, basically, what, what is the algorithm that was used to produce the signature, which is the thing over here after the third dot? 
And so the way it works is you take some JSON, like what is the user's role? It's admin. What is the user's name? It's AJ. What is the user's um, file upload limit? It's 20 gigabytes, right? You take that data in plain text as JSON, and then you stringify it and convert it to base64. And that's what this thing in the middle becomes. Then the algorithm that's on the left is what is used to create the signature that is on the right. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? OK. So there's this company called Auth0, which I don't know if they created it or if they're just like the pioneers of like pushing it forward, but they have excellent repositories for JWT. And there are all sorts of ways that you can use this. This can solve the problem of like, was it me that posted or was it an app that posted on my behalf or da 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 da? Um, where is the JWT module? I think it's called Node JWT. But basically, um, you could use this. Oh, they call it JSON Web Token. They all spelled out, I think, is what it is. There we go. No JSON Web Token. So you could use this to take some arbitrary data from one site on behalf of some user. And then you could take that token and you could hand it around to some other site. And that site could say, like, even though I didn't create this token, I know by verifying this public key that's posted on this user's website or um, this user's uh, subdomain on this website or something, that it was on behalf of this user and therefore I'm going to allow it even though I didn't create it, which is um, kind of cool. So their example is pretty straightforward. This is what it looks like. Is you require a JSON web token, you give it some uh, JSON, and then in this case it's using a shared secret example, so you would have somehow given this secret to someone else beforehand. Um, and then it creates the token, and then the person that has that shared secret can verify that token. This is not something that you, would, uh, you wouldn't send the shared secret to a browser. That would be bad. The next example that they have is one you can send to a browser. Or let me see, maybe they don't have it. Uh, okay, yeah, so this, this here is an example of using that in the, you, so the public.pem is a public key, so this could be stored on awesomeapp.com slash public key.pem or whatever. So you could give anybody access to this and then some other service that's acting on behalf of the user or yourself, you can take it in and verify that you signed it with your private key. So the sign, instead of passing in the public, you pass in the private. Um, and you have to specify, I don't know where the example is, but you have to specify that instead of using, the default is to use the HMAC, is to use the, the shared secret. You just have to specify that this isn't a shared secret, this is a private key, and then um, it can do that. And they have express modules, like there's express JWT, Um, so this creates the user object from whatever JSON was stored in the web token. So uh, when you make an API request, instead of relying on a cookie, instead you manually specify an authorization bearer header, just like you do with Facebook or Twitter or GitHub or any of the other OAuth sites. It's just authorization bearer instead of authorization basic, and then you put the token. And then on the server, you get to verify it. And then that user object, it's public, but it's verified that it hasn't been tampered with. So they couldn't like change their role from admin or from user to admin and that kind of thing. Anyway, so that's a broad picture of the kind of security that we're, is now becoming available to us. And uh, two examples of 